In the late 1800s, the worlds of biology, photography, and criminology would come together to ask a tantalizing question. Might the human retina retain the final image a person sees before death? And if so, would careful examination of the eyeball therefore be a surefire way of solving every murder? Because after all, the killer's image would be imprinted on the victim's eyes. Tonight, we explore one of the most tantalizing and bizarre theories in police work, a notion that gripped optometrists, photographers, and detectives alike. I'm Peter Laws, and tonight we look at the final witness on our curious past. This fascinating idea was first put forward in the 17th century, not by an optometrist or criminologist, but rather a Jesuit priest called Christopher Shiner. He claimed to have made an amazing observation in the retina of a frog. He swore that he could see the faint but very present imprint on the frog's eye, an imprint that matched what the frog had been looking at just before the point of death. Shiner wondered if it might be possible to somehow fix or lock this image into place so that it could be observed later by other people. But it was the 17th century. The idea of locking an actual image into place was impossible. The only way to achieve something like that back then would have been through painting or drawing, or, you know, which would ultimately only be an artist's impression of the scene. But then, in the 1840s, a marvelous new invention started to rekindle the hopes of Shiner's idea, and that was, of course, the invention of photography. It was 1876 when a physiologist called Franz Christian Ball first discovered rhodopsin. Now, this photosensitive protein is found in the rod cells of the retina, and it behaves in a similar way to the plate of a camera. The visual pigment will lose color and bleach in the light. And yet in the darkness, a purple shade, a kind of remnant can be seen, almost like an after image. Now, Ball was actually unable to do any real research into his discovery because he tragically died very young at the age of 30 from tuberculosis. And yet his research into rhodopsin made an impact on many other people. The key person, however, who was influenced by Ball was called Wilhelm Friedrich Kuhn. It was said that he was incredibly excited and enthusiastic to be taken on Ball's discoveries, and so he began to experiment on various animals. His hope was that he could bleach the external images onto their retinas, that it would be like having a photograph of their final moment. And so only one year later, in 1877, he developed a technique which he used on rabbits. I'm going to tell you what that technique is now, and I just have to warn you, if you're an animal lover, you may find this uh, distressing. Here is a description of Kuhn's rabbit work from a Nobel Prize winning biochemist from the day, a man called George Wald. An albino rabbit was fastened with its head facing a barred window. From this position, the rabbit could see only a gray and clouded sky. The animal's head was covered for several minutes with a cloth to adapt its eyes to the dark, that is, to let rhodopsin accumulate in its rods. Then the animal was exposed for three minutes to the light. It was immediately decapitated. The eye removed and cut open along the equator, and the rear half of the eyeball containing the retina laid in a solution of alum for fixation. The next day, Kuhn saw printed upon the retina in bleached and unaltered rhodopsin a picture of the window with the clear pattern of its bars. Kuhn called these images optograms. And when he looked at this optogram of the rabbit, he was astounded. It really does look like the inverted image of the barred windows of that room. Almost like the type of light reflection you might get in the curve of a balloon when you blow it up. And this really had been the very window that the rabbit had been gazing at before the point of death. Apparently, a scientist from Manchester, England, replicated these experiments and, sure enough, got similar results. And so Kuhn was incredibly excited. Surely, if he applied this procedure to human eyes, he would get the same results. He got his opportunity to experiment with this in 1880. And the subject of his study was the retina of a German man called Erhard Gustav Reif. 
In July of that year, Reif had been driven insane with grief for the death of his wife. He had taken the two youngest children in his family and drowned them in the Rhine River. He was sentenced to death by guillotine. Kuhn sensed an opportunity, so he was on hand at the execution to remove Reif's eye on the day. The date, by the way, was November 16th, 1880, and Kuhn had to act quickly. Reif placed his head in the guillotine, the executioner dropped the blade, and then Kuhn very quickly picked up the decapitated head and carefully removed the retinas. He then took his optogram, which was completed within 10 minutes of the blade coming down. Now, the results were ambiguous, but there was a shape on the man's retinas. Sadly, the optograms did not survive the passing of time, but Kuhn did draw what he saw in them for his research. Well, was it the blade of a guillotine that he could see? Critics said, how could it have been? Because Reif was blindfolded when the blade came down. It did, however, look what could be at least a set of steps, making Kuhn wonder, could this be the final image of his life? The steps he just walked up to reach the guillotine? Is that the image that was stamped on his eyeballs at the point of death? This idea that the human eye might work as a camera would, capturing the final sight, was just too intriguing not to explore. After all, Ball had discovered Rhodopsin in 1876. That was a time when there were astonishing developments, not only in medicine, but in photography. The eye certainly felt like a camera, the most advanced camera of all. And so what if its lenses could contain information? Well, when word of this theory reached law enforcement, it wasn't long before they saw a potential game changer for the world of homicide police work. But lawmakers learned that there would have to be fast since Kuhn made it clear optograms would only work effectively on the retinas of freshly murdered victims and ideally that they were murdered in laboratory conditions, so a very narrow window. Despite these warnings, uh, detectives pressed ahead and looked for potential cases in which they could employ this tantalizing new technique. And there really were several attempts to use this retina method in murders. Uh, for example, there was the slaying of an elderly woman in Berlin, 1877. But I'd like to focus on the killing of a young woman in 1880 as illustrative of what I'm talking about. It was a Wednesday, January the 8th, when an 18-year-old woman was brutally murdered in the northwest of England. Her name was Sarah Jane Roberts, and she'd come north from Pembroke in South Wales. She worked as a servant uh, when she came north, and the crime happened in the evening in one of the most heavily urbanised areas of Manchester. Sarah had been working in the house of Richard Greenwood that night, doing servant jobs, but Greenwood had to head out for a meeting. Interestingly, the day before, he had received a mysterious letter pushed through his letterbox asking him to go out and meet with a man um, to talk about a land purchase. So Greenwood went, but nobody turned up for the meeting at the pub. So annoyed, he headed back home to discover that his house had turned into a horrendous murder scene. His servant lay there, dead in the kitchen from two terrible blows to her head, one at the back of her skull and the other right over her eye, her right eye. According to reports, they, these wounds had both, quote, penetrated the bone. His wife, Mrs. Greenwood, was actually at home at the time of the murder. She'd been ill in bed, but she rushed, uh, he rushed in to find her and uh, to talk to her. And she was in distress, saying that earlier someone had knocked on the door and she just assumed Sarah the servant had welcomed in one of her friends until a chilling scream ripped through the house coming from the kitchen. Despite being bedridden, the woman managed to drag herself to the top of the stairs to call out, Jane, Jane, as in Sarah Jane, but there was no answer. She managed to get down the staircase and saw uh, Jane on the kitchen floor writhing in clear pain. And so Mrs. Greenwood flung the front door open and cried out into the street, murder. The nation was gripped with this mystery but some law keepers believe the answer to it all might be found in Sarah's eyes. On Friday, the 16th of January of 1880, the Manchester Courier reported that victims' eyes were examined very closely. On the day of Sarah's burial, three days after her murder, Sarah's coffin was prized open and her eyes were peeled open and subjected to what the Courier described as, quote, microscopic examination. They were photographed at a very short distance and then the coffin was closed and Sarah was laid to rest. 
but there were still hopes that she may still say something through her eyes. The photographs were magnified and studied, but hopes of a clue were dashed. There was no sign of a killer or even a window frame. Now, did this mean optogram techniques were a dead end theory? Well, not according to an honorary surgeon at the Royal Eye Hospital who told the Manchester Times at the, around, around that time that the problem here was that they'd only photographed the eyes three days after the murder. Dr. Emrys Jones said it would have been better if her eyes had been removed as soon as possible after she had died. Then they could have been rushed to a team of optical specialists who would scan the retinas for the killer's face. Leaving it for three days like they did meant that Sarah had never been able to share her final secret and that it had tragically faded forever through bad police practice. This became the earliest case in UK legal history to feature the photography of eyeballs for the latent image of a killer, and that first attempt had been a failure. The technique would be used sporadically after that. It was even employed during the hunt for Jack the Ripper. Annie Chapman was the second victim of Jack the Ripper, at least the second that we know of. And on September the 8th, 1888, she was murdered and mutilated by the entrance to the yard of 29 Hanbury Street in London. She had two deep gashes uh, from the left to the right of her neck. And this was the same technique used on the previous victim, Mary Ann Nichols. The Ripper had also mutilated her abdomen, such was his approach to murder. The police investigating the crime were not filled with confidence, though. The optography technique didn't really feel that promising. But the brutality of these crimes made them want to try everything. So they took up-close photographs of Annie Chapman's blue eyes. According to some records that I found, they didn't have to prise her eyelids open because when she died, it said that her eyes were wide and staring. Yet, once again, the result was useless. There was no image imprinted on the retinas. Now, despite these failed results, the techniques continued to be used across the world with investigators hoping that one day they may find the leering face of a killer on the eyes of the victim and then put him or her behind bars. For example, on the 12th of January, 1895, the Blackburn Standard on Saturday reported that optography was being used in a homicide over in the United States. Two women had been murdered in Jamestown, New York, and nobody knew who the killer was. But the article said that the eyes of both women had been subject to intense microscopic examination. And the writer of that article claimed that in one of the eyes, the investigators had indeed saw a distinct picture of a man. Frustratingly, the face was not clear, but the paper said, quote, his form is said to be distinct and his clothes recognizable even down to the wrinkles of his trousers. Later, the Washington Times edition from Wednesday, February the 25th, 1940, ran a story with the title, Image on her retina may show girl's slayer. The girl in question was 20-year-old Tracy Hollander, a woman from Aurora who was clubbed to death with a grave stake in the grounds of St. Nicholas's Cemetery just a week before. The police arranged for close-up pictures to be taken of the eyes to look for an imprint, and the paper said the picture would be shown to the grand jury on the following Saturday, but the image didn't reveal anything substantial. In that case, if you're interested, Tracy Hollander's ex-boyfriend became the prime suspect and was tried twice but found not guilty on both counts. Her murderer was therefore never discovered, as far as I know at least, and sadly her eyes were unable to solve her own death. Now, despite him helping to introduce the world to optography, Kuhn continued to make the point that his procedure would likely only work under very strict conditions of location, subject, and in particular, time. For example, he once wrote this. I am not prepared to say that eyes which have remained in the head an hour or more after decapitation will no longer give satisfactory optograms, Indeed, the limit for obtaining a good image seems to be in rabbits from around 60 to 90 minutes, while the eyes of oxen seem to be useless after one hour. Now, despite all of these failures, optography appeared to have a rare success in 1924 
when a German man called Fritz Heinrich Angerstein brutally murdered his entire household, staff, and his family with an axe. Now, Angerstein said he hadn't intended to kill so many people that day. He'd murdered his wife and then tried to commit suicide, but when that attempt failed, he became furious, and so he murdered his mother-in-law, saying that she should be punished for how nasty she had been to his wife, her daughter. That uh, he had just killed that daughter didn't seem to enter his head. He then murdered the maid, because he later told the court that she wasn't very good at making food. And then next he slaughtered his sister-in-law, the bookkeeper, the clerk, the gardener, and his assistant. And by the end of it, this head-spinning massacre racked up eight victims. But at first, when the police attended the scene, they thought maybe otherwise. They listened to his claim, Angerstein's claim, that the house had been attacked by robbers and that bandits had murdered everybody, including an attempt on him, and yet somehow he had miraculously survived. Now, Angerstein hadn't thought this through, of course. There was no sign of a robbery, his fingerprints were all over the murder weapon, and he was arrested and charged. But he stuck to his story of the bandits. But then a University of Cologne professor presented evidence to the police. He said they had taken photographs of two of the victims and this time the pictures actually revealed an image. Supposedly the professor claimed it was an image clear as day of Angerstein bearing down on the victim with, in their final moments, clearly holding an ax in his two-handed grip. What's fascinating about this case is not so much that the optograph proved he was the killer, it didn't really have to. You see, when Angerstein heard about this retinal photograph of him holding the hatchet, he immediately dropped his story of the bandits and he admitted to the entire thing. Making this, perhaps, the only murder case on record that was ever solved by the retina of an eye, albeit in a very roundabout way. Now, even though the practice of optography was patchy and ultimately unconvincing, it still caught the imagination of writers who started to include the procedure in their plots. Everyone from uh, like Rudyard Kipling to Jules Verne used this concept as a plot device in their stories. And even these days, you know, an episode of Doctor Who in 2013 used this idea, and the TV show Fringe in 2008 also used the same thing. But back in the 1920s, there were, because there were these cases going around, uh, murderers were starting to get paranoid that they may get found out through the latent retinal image. And so in some cases, even the killers themselves would make a special effort to destroy the eyeballs of their victims. For example, in 1927, an unarmed policeman called George Gutteridge was shot, but the location of his wounds suggested that he didn't want to leave a trace in the eyes of the victim because two bullets entered Gutteridge's head, one here and one there through the ice. This notion even came up again 60 years later when a woman murdered her mother-in-law in, in Alsace in 1990 and after killing she gouged out the victim's eyes telling the police that she wanted to destroy the evidence of her image being somehow trapped within them. Now critics of optography, of which there are many, argued and still argue that, well it's an interesting theory, but when tested, it really belongs more in the realms of science fiction, which is why you don't really hear about its use today beyond television drama. And yet, the incredible definition we can obtain with modern camera techniques and scanners may inspire some researchers to revive the work of Kuhn. That seemed to be the case in 1975, when police in Heidelberg, Germany, actively tried to re-explore Kuhn's work in modern police techniques True enough, the findings did indeed render some distinct and persuasive images from the eyes of dead rabbits. But even with the advanced technology of 1975, the study concluded that the telltale eye theory was simply too vague, tricky, and potentially naive to pursue as a serious forensic technique. And now, almost 50 years later, I wonder if a researcher somewhere might want to take another look at this idea with another half century of camera technology on hand. But until then, I suppose we will have to wait to see if the human retina could ever truly retain a photographic image of a killer or a window or whatever else it sees before the lids close over and the eyes speak no more. I'm Peter Laws, and you've been listening to The Final Witness on Our Curious Past.
Hey, thanks for listening to this episode. Uh, just a reminder that our Curious Past, along with my other podcasts, are normally audio in audio format, but I'm experimenting with trying them out in video. So if you like that, let me know. Uh, subscribe, like, do all the sort of stuff people ask people to do on YouTube. And uh, hopefully, you know, I'll get the impression that you like this stuff and I'll continue doing it. But for now, if you want to find out more about me, my books and my other podcasts, check out peterlaws.co.uk um, or follow links in the show notes and that sort of stuff. But until next time, keep your eyes open for some interesting, curious stories. Bye-bye. <laughs>